What's up my G's and welcome back to my Dragon Quest journey, the series where I explore the worlds and stories of the Dragon Quest franchise. In this video, we will be diving into the history, the story, and the gameplay of Dragon Quest V. The last game I reviewed was Dragon Quest IV, and in that video, I stated that that was my favorite Dragon Quest game of the franchise so far, but that quickly changed as I played Dragon Quest V. I'll leave a link in the description of all the Dragon Quest games I've reviewed so far, so check those out if you haven't already. If you like this video, please subscribe and hit the like button down below, and don't forget to drop a comment. Also, don't forget to hit the notification bell so you get notified every time I drop one of my videos. It really helps the channel out, and I really appreciate it. And with all that said and done, let's jump right in. Dragon Quest V was originally released in Japan in 1992 for the Super Famicom. Due to lower sales in North America of the prior Dragon Quest games, and Enix not wanting to pay for larger cartridge ROMs that were needed to fit the English language dialogue, Dragon Quest V wasn't released in North America until 2004 for the PlayStation 2. And that's the version I decided to play. It was a remake, and with updates in graphics, music, as well as a bunch of added new features. Like the Sugoroku boards from Dragon Quest 3. Another remake was released for the Nintendo DS in Japan in 2008, with North America following in 2009. Just like the other games, Akira Toriyama returned with the art designs, and I thought the designs for the monsters were on another level. They weren't so simple like the other Dragon Quest games, and then being 3D made it even better. Also returning was Koichi Sugiyama, who composed the game's music. Yuji Horii also returned with the story, and he did a really good job with this one. The story starts off with King Pancras pacing back and forth in his throne room, anxiously awaiting the birth of his child. Sancho comes downstairs and informs the king that his child has been born, and King Pancras quickly heads upstairs to his wife to see his wife holding his baby boy. This is where you name your character. For the sake of telling the story, I named him Grimace, so I will be referring to him as Grimace. After this scene, you are controlling Grimace as a child, traveling on a ship with his father. There is a brief talk between Rodrigo and Pancras, and we also get to meet his daughter Nira. From here Pancras and Grimace travel to the town of Wheelbrook, where Sancho lives. Here Pancras and his son meet up with Duncan's wife and his daughter Bianca, who they accompany back to their town, Roundbeck. In Roundbeck, Bianca and Grimace find the little saber cat cub being picked on by some kids, who say they would give them the saber cat cub if they defeat the ghost at Uptatten Tower. That night, Bianca and Grimace travel northwest where they find Uptatten Tower. In the tower after fighting through many ghosts and almost ending up as food, the two head up onto the roof where they fight and defeat the evil housekeeper ghost and find the golden orb. Afterwards, the next morning, Grimace says goodbye to Bianca, and Pancras and Grimace head back to Wheelbrook. While in Wheelbrook, Grimace finds a man who wants to look at the golden orb, and afterwards he tells Grimace to look after his father. The next night, Grimace finds the spirit of honey in the basement of Sancho's house. She wants Grimace to return with her to her fairy country and help them defeat the Winter Queen to let Spring once again return to their fairy country. After defeating the Winter Queen and once again bringing Spring to the fairy country, Grimace and his father travel to the Kingdom of Coburg. And in Coburg, Pancras was hired to protect Prince Harry, but Prince Harry wanted nothing to do with him. Grimace instead became friends with him, but shortly after, Prince Harry is kidnapped. Grimace tells his father Pancras what happened, and together they hurry to find him and eventually they find him locked up in a jail cell, inside of a hideout. There Grimace and Pancras are attacked by a group of monsters. Pancras takes him out, and he tells Grimace to take Prince Harry and to escape. But before they can escape, another monster appears, the Bishop Lodja. He takes Grimace and Prince Harry hostage, and sends a duo of strong monsters after Pancras, and Pancras takes him out. But after Lodja threatens Prince Harry and Grimace's life, the two monsters beat down Pancras. Lodja then uses a fire spell to take Pancras out and Pancras is killed, but not before telling Grimace that his mother is still alive. Pancras and Grimace are no match for him. Lodja finds the golden orb on Grimace and he seems to know what it is and he decides to destroy it. He then takes Prince Harry and Grimace as slaves. Ten years pass by and we regain control of our hero. He and Harry have been working as slaves building a temple for Lodja and his boss, the king of the underworld, Nimzo. While there, they meet a guard who finds out that his sister Maria has also been taken as a slave. She is taken and is being whipped by slave masters, and Grimace and Harry quickly come to her aid and are thrown inside of jail cells. The guard who is Maria's brother shows up and frees them, and he tells them to escape and to take his sister with them. The guard puts all three of them inside of a barrel, and they float down the river, escaping their slavery. The barrel drifts until they arrive at a little church where Maria stays to become one of the nuns. Grimace and Harry say their goodbyes and they head back towards Coburg Castle. 
but they stop by Wheelbrook first. They find out that Wheelbrook has been destroyed by Coburg's soldiers and that the Queen has taken over and is threatening the land. They also search the cave there and they find the secret room. There Pankras left behind a note as well as the Zenithian sword. Together they find Ra's mirror and they use it to reveal the Queen's true form and defeat her as well. Afterwards, Maria and Prince Harry announce that they are going to get married and they stay behind the Coburg Castle. Grimace heads over to Mosferato where he meets with Rodrigo. There he finds out that Rodrigo is looking for someone to marry his daughter Nero. He sends Grimace along with three other prospects to search and retrieve the rings of water and fire as proof as their worthiness to marry his daughter. Grimace reunites with Bianca and with her help they are able to retrieve both magic rings. They make it back to Rodrigo where he sees that Bianca also likes Grimace and that Grimace might like her as well. Grimace is given the choice to marry either Bianca or Nera. It was a tough choice for me, either follow the path of the movie and marry Bianca or change it up and marry Nera instead. I took my time and decided that I liked Bianca more and I wanted to stay true to the movie. I chose to marry Bianca. I spent more time with her anyway. After the marriage, Rodrigo lets Grimace use his ship and Grimace and Bianca travel to the kingdom of Gotha where Grimace was born. They find out that Pankraz's brother has been ruling the country since Pankraz and Grimace were thought to be dead. Once the king finds out that Grimace is alive, he decided to give him the throne, but first Grimace must take the rite of passage and we also find out that Bianca is pregnant and must rest while this happens. After completing the rite of passage, Grimace returns and Bianca gives birth to twins, a boy and a girl. The kingdom has a celebration and during the night, Grimace wakes up and heads upstairs only to find out that Bianca has been abducted by monsters. Although the twins were kept safe by one of the maids, Bianca wasn't as lucky. Grimace goes off to find her, and after defeating the monsters who took her, both Bianca and Grimace were turned into stone for 8 long years. Their stone bodies were taken as treasure by treasure hunters, and Grimace was sold at an auction. Bianca was taken away for other reasons. Grimace sat on the front garden of a rich family as some sort of protection. One day the little boy of that family was playing outside, and he was also abducted by monsters. The father, mad that Grimace didn't protect his son, knocked the statue of Grimace over where he laid on his back for years until Sancho and the twins eventually came to save Grimace. Once they save Grimace, all together they search for Bianca. And while they don't find her, they do find out that Grimace's son turns out to be the legendary hero. They also decide to travel and look for the Zenithian equipment, it's consisting of the armor, helmet, shield, and sword. Grimace and his children all find the heavenly castle submerged in the ocean and helps restore it to a celestial state in the sky. Dr. Agon, who was found in the cave on the way to the heavenly castle, that to restore the castle, he needs to recover the golden orb. He sends Grimace to find the fairy forest and get the help of the fairy queen who created the orb in the first place. Grimace and his children find the fairy queen and she sends Grimace into the past where he trades his fake golden orb with his fake younger self for the real golden orb. I guess the orb that Lodza destroyed was a fake. Grimace takes the orb back to Dr. Agon, who uses it to restore the castle to its original celestial state in the sky. Grimace also goes to the Dragon Temple to get the Dragon Orb. There Grimace faces off against one of the monsters who Pankras fought when he was trying to save Prince Harry, as well as Lodja. The Dragon Orb is then used by Dr. Agon to restore his true form as the Zenith Dragon. With the Zenith Dragon's help, Grimace makes it to the temple where he was held as a slave. There he finds his Zenithian armor, as well as the statue of his wife Bianca. He defeats the king of the temple and retrieves the ring of life that restores Bianca back to her normal self. After saving Bianca, Grimace and his family use the ring of water, fire, and life to open the gates into the underworld, where they climb Mount Zugzwang and find Lodja, as well as Madalena, Grimace's mother. Grimace and his family fight Lodja, and after an annoying long battle, Lodja is finally defeated. But Lodja is only working for the king of the underworld, Nimzo. Together they continue to explore the mountain and eventually they find Nimzo and the final battle begins. Nimzo has two forms and this is another long battle but as long as you got enough sustainability, it's a walk in the park. Maybe it's because this game can be really annoying with the random battles. You can finish a fight and walk two steps and end the bite back in another battle. This probably helped me gain enough levels to make this fight a piece of cake. After the fight, the family return to the kingdom of Gotha where they celebrate as Pankras and Madalena watch down from the heavens above. This game took me a long time to finish, mostly because of real life, but it still took me a long time. Being a remake of the original, the PS2 version had 3D graphics and that was way more enjoyable. 
there was also this awesome feature that let some of the monsters you fight join your party, and it was kind of like you were able to capture them and use them like Pokemon. The monster designs were also really cool, and not as simple as the other games. They had detail, and were much more complicated in design. They had detail, and were much more complicated in design. My favorite was probably the Hyper Namon, who looked devious as hell. They looked like they could be boss monsters themselves. The game wasn't very hard, it was just really annoying with a lot of battles. I think I finished the game at like level 38, and that was with no grinding at all. I didn't even have to grind for money to buy armors or weapons. I did spend a lot of time at the casino though, to get the King Metal Sword that was stronger than any other sword. The dungeons were good sized, and they even challenged me a bit. My favorite was the Minecarts dungeon on the way to the Heavenly Castle. It was challenging and annoying at the same time, but it was also pretty fun. There was a lot of fights and also a lot of trial and error. It's exactly what you want from an RPG game. It was good old Dragon Quest, just on another level. All in all, this game was fun as hell, and I'm really glad I decided to start playing these games. I just wish I had done it sooner, while I had more time to play. It was also fun spotting all the differences between the game and the movie. I can see why people didn't like the movie, but I just had the opposite reaction after playing the game. I liked the movie even more. They took all the best parts of the story, and everything else was like side quests, and cramming too much into a movie isn't a good idea. Now to move on to the next game, and the final game of the Zenithian Trilogy, Dragon Quest VI. And judging by how long it took me to finish that game, I don't know exactly when I'll be dropping a review on that one, but it will be the next Dragon Quest game in line. After I finished the Zenithian Trilogy, I decided I'll go ahead and skip to Dragon Quest XI. I've had that game sitting on my shelf since Christmas, and I really want to play that one, so it's going to be the next game I play after Dragon Quest VI. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button to keep track of my videos, and also hit that like button if you like this video. It really helps the channel out, and I really appreciate it. I hope you guys will continue to join me on my journey into the worlds and stories of the Dragon Quest franchise, and I'll see you next time with the next Dragon Quest video. Peace out, my Gs.